Welcome to this third episode of the webinar series of the World Diamond Museum. Thank you so much for uh, your interest and participation. My name is Jakob van Moor, the World Diamond Museum Communications Director. During this spring and the coming summer, we will be hosting authors who contributed to the book Diamonds Across Time. But let me first hand over briefly to our founder and chairman, Alex Popov, for his words of welcome. Alex. Uh, thank you very much, Jakob. It's my pleasure to see everyone. It's um, a big honor uh, to have so many people with us during this uh, webinar series. And thank you everyone for your interest, for the interest in our books and what we are doing. This seminar is a little bit different. This webinar, I would put it this way, it's a little bit different from others because we were talking before that about the history about the very interesting people who um, traded in diamonds, who, um, who uh, mined diamonds, who wear diamonds, wore diamonds, and uh, less uh, spoke about the diamonds themselves without uh, minimizing the importance of, of historical and other issues, which I'm sure John will touch. The, this is the first time that we're gonna speak about diamonds themselves. And I think it's a great idea to start with the rarest of all, with the blue diamonds. And no one can uh, do it better than John King, whom I'm not going to introduce. Jaco will do it. Thank you, John, for joining us. And let's give you the panel and start listening to your fascinating stories. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alex. And uh, so, yes, indeed, we are proud to continue our webinar series with John King, a world-renowned expert in color diamonds. John is recently re retired from the Gemological, Gemological Institute of America, GIA, after four, more than 40 years of service. From 2008 to 2020, he was GIA's chief quality officer. His academic work in fine art included studies in color theory and color order systems, which supplemented his work in the laboratory. He has written extensively and lectured extensively on color diamonds and laboratory practice, and has created some of the world's most famous diamonds. He is a published scholar. Today, Mr. King will re present Rhapsody Rhapsody in Blue, the art and science of blue diamonds. Afterward, John will answer some of the questions that you will be asking through the chat. And our digital whiz, as always, Linda or I will be supervising this webinar. John, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm not able to share the screen while the other participants sharing. You can share the screen yeah. now. You can share the screen. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk with everybody. Uh, especially on a subject that is so uh, meaningful to me and so important. Uh, I have worked with color diamonds for a very long time and blue diamonds have always had a very special place for me in that whole mix. Um, you know, I wrote the article for Diamonds Across Time and in that uh, article I titled my piece, One in 10,000. And that's a, a phrase that's been used in the diamond industry for quite a while to signify the rarity of colored diamonds. Now, I don't believe it uh, is an exact figure or meant to be. I think it's a concept. But my hunch is, if you really looked across mines, it might differ some. But on average, it probably is at least that rare to come across colored diamonds. Um, I, as you'll begin to see through this talk as we go on, uh, have a tendency of always kind of saying to myself, hmm, that's an interesting concept, but what does it look like? So what does it look like? So this, this image sort of simulates that idea of one in 10,000 diamonds. Um, 
and I think that's kind of like part of what you're going to see is this interest in context and how we play with these things. As I said, uh, my article take was part of Diamonds Across Time. If you've not had a chance to see the book, I would encourage you to. It's a wonderful reference and comp combined of much information from like, as Alex said, not only uh, jewelry history, gemstone history, a little bit of technical writing from my side, but I think it really kind of puts these magnificent stones into perspective. And it's kind of a pleasure to kind of share and be part of that book. Uh, the efforts that are going on as is mankind, I think are wonderful and uh, can only get better over time with talks like this, books like they've done. I think it will really be quite, uh, quite good to continue to spread the kind of the word. Um, often when I start a talk, I, I sometimes use a quote from uh, the, the ancient times that would that would talk to, oh, how, you know, rare diamonds are and how they were, you know, part of the, the uh, treasures of the gods uh, for their hardness and their geometric qualities. But um, I think you'll see as we go forward today how I uh, want to, to do that, but I want to bring some other aspects to it too. And that's why I'm starting here with a, an excerpt from a poem, Rhapsody by Frank O'Hara. And I think this aspect of uh, bringing in the richness of what we can experience from our seeing and, and the analogies that we can get in viewing diamonds is going to be so important. So when he says, you know, I cough lightly in the smog of desire and my eyes water achingly imitating the true blue, I think gets so much emotion going. And I think that's really a kind of important part with these stones. But, um, you know, I think there's many different ways of evaluating. And I think this is part of what we're gonna do. We're gonna step through some of these different ways that diamonds are uh, observed and looked at and, and how they're classified. And, um, you know, certainly I come at it, as Yaakov had said, uh, from a, a kind of, I think, somewhat more unique perspective. I certainly bring a lot of gemological science to the table, but I'm also a practicing artist. And uh, I think it goes from this kind of standardized methods of uh, observing, testing, as we see on these images from a GIA laboratory where uh, there's a lot of controls that take place to things that happen in the studio. And I know some of my friends out there who are artists would say, well, there's a lot that's controlled in the studio also. Uh, I wanna control the light. I control everything about how I'm viewing because it's, it's so important uh, in my capabilities to understand what's going on. And, uh, you know, neither of these are new. I mean, the, these kind of standardized methods versus, you know, things that happen for an artist go back centuries. But if I come and think about some of these standardized approaches that occur in a laboratory, uh, as I say, you know, there's, there's controlled lighting, uh, controlled viewing even. And somehow you, you could easily think, wow, that really just diminishes, uh, you know, the kind of charm of the stone. But, you know, a laboratory's goal is really to uh, ensure repeatability, consistency. So in doing that, you want across all people this opportunity to do things the same way with the desire to come to the sim very similar same results. So they're, you know, when you grade a diamond, you're grading it under one type of light that's been chosen to do this. You, uh, you're grading in only one position, regardless of what the cut or the shape of the stone is. And uh, it, there's an attempt to look at the overall appearance, not to pick out the best color, the worst color, but to really kind of play off that. And then of course, um, it's a systematic method of ordering color uh, and it's three dimensionality. So uh, a gemologist looks at the color from the perspective of its lightness, its strength or purity uh, from a grayness to a very saturated color. And then it also uh, addresses these changes in hue as it goes around the hue circle. 
when this is done, we're able to uh, create charts that show these interrelationships of stones. And I studied with a, a couple of uh, painters at Hunter College who would probably look at these charts and go, hmm, yeah, you know, I, I paint those kinds of charts. I, I use that kind of uh, systematic movement between colors to create this kind of amazing world and relationship. Here, what we're really trying to do is we're looking at the science side. So we are wanting to understand interrelationships, wanting to understand how a col one color would relate to another. And what happens from this, uh, this kind of grid of colors is there's divisions that are placed within it where uh, colors are grouped into qualities of lightness and depth of color. Um, it's not about giving a name to one specific color appearance so much as very similar colors. So you would get a group that's referred to, for example, as a fancy intense, which would be a lighter, strong color, uh, or a fancy vivid, which is even stronger, a very strong saturated color, or a deep color. And uh, these, these terms help one understand the interrelationship of the colors and uh, you know, what, they, what they would mean to each other. And of course, as a gemologist, you know, I think what we are trying to do is we're trying to understand the value, the rarity, uh, the uniqueness, if you will, of color in a blue color, for example, just uh, through the kind of data. So I would, for example, I'd say, well, if there's, you know, a thousand fancy blue diamonds, but there's 10 fancy vivid, I know those fancy vivids are much rarer. If there's a thousand one carat diamonds and there's one 50 carat diamond, it puts into perspective to me a, a sense of rarity. Um, and that's kind of a fascinating side of what happens in that world of gemology. If we look a little bit at some of these ways of valuing from this gemological side, I think, you know, here, here we list a few items that kind of give this idea of uh, rarity from, from the gemological side. Uh, blue diamonds occur in a very, very narrow range of the hue circle. Um, as I say, we're not describing a single sensation, we're describing a range of color. And uh, some of you may notice that all of a sudden, off to my side here, the sun decided to come out. So that's where we're getting a little brighter today. Um, this, this narrow range is uh, not like what experience you would get with a yellow hue or even pink diamonds that occur kind of in transition naturally across a wider range. I think the difference here too is diamonds we describe as blue and when people talk about blue in diamond, they don't group these things together with modified blues. Um, you don't think of green blue diamonds and blue diamonds as the same family. Their cause of occurrence is different. They, they're in very different kinds of appearances. Nothing like it is as the same as, you know, for pinks, where pinks transition into purplish pinks very readily. There is a, a kind of natural similar cause of color. So I think you think of it very differently. This, these blues are really kind of unique. And as I say, even though we've established a kind of wider range of appearances, their occurrence is really narrow. They are, I mean, it's hard to even talk about what small fraction of a percent of the, even of all the colored diamonds, which is already uh, a rarer group, what they embody in terms of production. I think if you think about the number of stones you see hitting the market today, the number you hear about in the trade press, it's, it's very, very few. But other interesting factors about these stones, they're, they're semiconductors of electricity. They have a phosphorescent reaction to shortwave ultraviolet. Uh, and they're a very rare diamond type. It's called a type 2B. Now, gemologists classify diamonds uh, by their, the absence or presence of nitrogen in that atomic structure, nitrogen being the most common. 
Um, type one diamonds uh, have nitrogen prevalent in their structure, whereas type two do not. Type two are thought of to be very chemically pure. And the interesting things with blue diamonds is the cause of color is the, the replacing of uh, carbon atoms as it forms billions of years ago in the earth with boron. So very kind of unique characteristics about this stone. Um, where does all this stuff kind of start? Who, like on some level, I think one would say, who cares? I would never be testing a diamond to see what happens under shortwave ultraviolet light. Um, but, you know, it was only in the last, you know, 150, 50 years to 100 years uh, where there were forms of treatment that started to occur. And that would cause gemologists to really start looking deeper into ways to begin to separate stones that had been treated from naturally occurring stones. So this is where this exploration of spectroscopy and what it could begin to tell you to separate these stones started to come into the mix. Um, and, and that's where gemologists use these different categories and traits to really kind of understand more and more about these stones. Um, an interesting, more recent factor too is the last point here I make. These diamonds, um, they have been found only in the last number of years uh, to occur much, much deeper in the earth than other, other diamonds, than most diamonds, if you will. Uh, research has taken place on some of the inclusions, the mineral inclusions in blue diamonds, and they've been, uh, it's become clear that they are super deep in the earth. Again, another amazing fact that really happens. And it's likely that the boron, which is more surface, uh, you know, uh, parts, that they, through subduction, was drawn very deep into the earth as the tectonic plates would shift. So kind of fascinating uh, information from this kind of development of blue diamonds and, and their uniqueness. Now, often I talk about a number of different characteristics that's brought uh, diamonds, colored diamonds, to greater and greater attention. I, I talk a lot about uh, you know, things like um, mining, uh, technical articles, exhibitions, cutting innovations, uh, this allure of historic stones and, and auction sales. Uh, all of these things you know, uh, really had a huge effect on bringing dim colored diamonds to the forefront of the industry and public's attention really beginning in the 1970s. And the mine that's talked of most typically for that kind of information was the Argyle mine in Western Australia, which brought, uh, which brought a very high volume of colored diamonds and particularly rare pinks to public attention. Uh, that mine ran its mine life uh, from the early 1980s uh, and closed last year. Uh, so very interesting what that will mean to the, to the flow of diamonds in the future. But I want to come back again to blues. And I would argue if there's one mine that stands out in terms of uh, the awareness of blue diamonds, it would be the Culinan mine, formerly known as the premier mine in South Africa. Uh, it has produced many of the most famous blue diamonds uh, in contemporary times. Now, certainly we know of historic diamonds that go back further but, um, and, and are believed to be of Indian origin, but really the, the uh, Kulinan mine, which opened in 1902, you know, has contributed many of the most famous diamonds since then. And we had an opportunity in the late 90s to visit the mine. Uh, when we were writing a technical article for the GIA uh, quarterly journal, Gems and Gemology. Uh, we went to the Culinan mine and we also were able to study rough and polished blue diamonds uh, in Johannesburg at the time. Uh, this was, you know, kind of a very interesting time uh, that was going on for GIA and uh, it was only uh, three years earlier in 1995 that uh, the enhancements to the colored diamond grading system were introduced. 
uh, these enhancements added some of the new grade terms to better describe the diamonds It articulated them across all hues. Uh, and it really detailed out uh, grading methodology. Uh, following on that, I was very keen to begin to kind of get more detailed information out about specific colors. And this was one of the first was the blue diamonds that we did at this time. And that, that kind of ability to share the techno, technical information was, I think, very important to, again, uh, beginning to understand just how rare these diamonds were. It was an opportunity to look at them in relation and to understand their occurrence and, and uh, what was being seen. What we also saw from the, uh, from the Kulin and mine from those late 90s and what we saw in the works actually uh, at the time of that article was this group of diamonds that became known as the Midnight Collection. They were unveiled at the Dome in London for the Millennium at 2000. They were shown in conjunction with the 203 carat Millennium Star. Um, this was a, a key exhibition to kick off the Millennium uh, and it was focused around blue diamonds. Just an amazing collection. You know, you think of, you think of 11 diamonds like this being shown today, uh, six of them over 10 carats, nine fancy vivid, unbelievable to kind of see this range of stones. So a very fascinated time and a great opportunity for us uh, when it came to, you know, seeing these stones and kind of starting uh, to see more and more exhibitions focused around uh, diamonds in general and certainly colored diamonds. Uh, the centerpiece of the Midnight Collection, which was this 27 carat uh, vivid blue diamond known as the Heart of Eternity, was uh, also exhibited in an exhibition called Splendor of Diamonds at uh, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., and that took place in 2003. Uh, it was just an amazing uh, show that pulled together, as you see in that little inset photo, a range of stones that uh, you, you may never see together again. The 100 carat vivid yellow all knot diamond, the, the pink star, the 59 carat vivid pink, this blue, the 203 carat millennium star, and then the pumpkin, the Musayef yet, uh, Musayef red and the ocean dream, a blue green stone, an orange diamond, a red diamond. It, uh, it was again this, this way of putting colored diamonds in front of everyone uh, that had never occurred before. And you know, we, we talk about the uh, cutting innovations that were going on. You, know, you see in the inset at the upper right, uh, a photo I took when we were in Johannesburg. And this was when the, uh, the Heart of Eternity had just been lasered from the bigger piece. So the Heart of Eternity is that second piece from the left. Uh, and that was the start of the cutting process for that stone. Uh, when, I, when I think of cutting and I think of the innovations that started occurring for colored diamonds in general, I'm, I'm drawn back to, you know, Stanley Doppelt and Louis Glick and their work on the, the starburst or Henry Grossbard and the radiant cut. And the, the efforts were really um, looking for cuts that would begin to uh, actually hide inclusions on low end D to Z stones. So these like lighter yellow stones. And what they ended up finding was these cutting styles not only kind of began to do all of that for hiding some inclusions, but it also had the effect of collecting and intensifying the appearance of the color. Uh, so that began to kind of come into play and what we used to say is it's not that there were more colored diamonds being mined, but there were more colored diamonds because of the cutting that was happening at that time. Well, these techniques have grown uh, more and more being applied. You can see some of the effects of what happens. I like to think of this as really the sculpting of these forms. And this is the start of painting with light. And you see the uh, stones, the set on the left, all have very similar body color. And you can't do much more than what you start with. But at the same time, you see the face up appearance of these stones can really differ. 
the collection can really have different effects based on the cutting styles, the proportions, the inner facet angles, all of that is kind of what starts to take place. Uh, we were also very lucky, uh, the stones on the right, again, it's the heart of eternity on the right. The other stone is the blue heart, which is a 30 carat fancy deep blue diamond in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution. And again, I think you see the difference in the face up appearance. And when we look at the cutting style at the bottom, it's remarkably different. So the thinking about how to maneuver the crystal and what to do with it uh, is really quite exceptional. And really it's, uh, it's multi-layered too. Not only is, are you trying to ensure uh, best color, but there's considerations around clarity. Where are the characteristics that you may uh, want to remove and, and what effect will that have? How much cutting do I need to do uh, in order to maybe have higher clarity? Those are choices that are made and it's uh, hard choices, not an easy thing uh, to result in good color, clarity, size, and well-cut stones. But I think these blues are premium examples of what can be done by these master cutters. Historically too, I think we have some interesting things happening and uh, they, they fuel our fascination. And when we look here, you know, we're really, we're really looking at, I think, uh, you know, the, the stories that go back through time, it's not new. You see on the left, a uh, picture of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier from the 1600s. He was a, a gem merchant who traveled extensively throughout the uh, Far East, uh, uh, procuring gems that he often took back and sold to uh, royalty, and especially uh, King Louis XIV in, in France. Uh, the drawing is a, a drawing from Tavernier of a blue rough diamond uh, that was said to weigh roughly 115 carats. I think it was 112 metric carats. Uh, this diamond was sold to Louis XIV in 1668. Uh, and a few years later, it was cut into a 69 carat diamond that you see in the upper left. Uh, and that became known as the French blue. Uh, a few, in, in 1749, quite a few years later, Louis XIV had the stone mounted into a ceremonial order of the Golden Fleece. And then of course, it was in 1792 during the revolution, the piece was stolen. And interestingly, in 1812, a blue diamond weighing 45 carats is documented in London and noted as owned by Henry Hope. Um, so a kind of interesting intrigue, mystery, you know. Um, I'm sure, you know, Mr. Hope didn't uh, want anyone to think that was the French blue. Um, and nothing was said at that time. There's been interesting uh, research done in more recent years, just back in 2009, where uh, the model of the French blue was studied and <clears throat> it does appear very easily that the hope could have been cut from the French blue. Uh, Frank Wade, even in 1919, uh, wrote article, an article about blue diamonds. And he was talking about the different categories of blue, but you uh, might be able to see in the small print, first thing he talks about is the hope and the intrigue around the hope. So I think that's always been fascinating. Uh, and, and these diamonds have these long, amazing histories like this that has drawn us in. So I think if I were to now kind of take uh, a moment and move from these famous diamonds history, to our experiences with them more recently and our opportunities that we've had with them in the uh, gemological settings, uh, I would speak again to the hope, which is uh, just too amazing to stop talking about. Uh, 45 carats uh, in the collection of the Smithsonian. It was first graded by GIA in 1988. Uh, a colleague of mine had been down in Washington and was visiting the Smithsonian and they happened to mention to him 
oh, you know, the hope's going to be taken out of the mounting to do some repairs on the mounting. So we said, hmm, how about if we come down, bring some equipment and grade it? And it's like, sure, why not? So we had an opportunity to drive down from New York with a bunch of equipment and do the first grading on the Hope. Uh, luckily for us, after the uh, system enhancements for colored diamond grading went into effect in 96, we had another opportunity when it was out of the mounting to up update it again. So the grading of it was as a fancy deep grayish blue, an amazing rare, rare stone. You also see here, I had mentioned this phosphorescence effect. That's the phosphorescence in red that you see of the hope. Now, I think people like to believe all blue diamonds phosphoresce like this. Not true. It's a very, very rare effect. It's often very fleeting, uh, very faint. They do phosphoresce, but it's almost easy to miss if you're not really paying attention. The hope, on the other hand, uh, had this very strong phosphorescence that lasted 30, 40 seconds. The Wittelsbach graph diamond is another rare diamond dating back to the 1600s. And with that, again, places it as an Indi stone of Indian origin. Uh, it was sold in 2008 and set a, a record at that time uh, for over 24 million diamonds. It was uh, recut shortly after that to kind of remove small chips and wear, but also to enhance the color. Um, so uh, again, I remember, I remember being asked at work one day to come and, and give an observation on a diamond. It was kind of an unusual and Everybody wanted you know, to weigh in and I went and as soon as I sat down to take a look, the hair on my neck stood up because I knew what I was looking at. And it was the Wittelsbach. Um, an amazing situation to be able to, to see these stones and see it through even the recutting process. These two diamonds have very similar appearances. As you see here, they have very, very similar phosphorescent reactions. Um, so, Everyone had always wondered, is it possible they both came from the same rough? Is it possible perhaps it was that Tavernier rough diamond? Uh, the diameters were similar. It almost looked like the Wittelsbach could have sat on top of the Hope. Uh, well, in 2010, uh, after the Wittelsbach had been recut, it was on display with the Hope Diamond at the Smithsonian. And yes, you can guess it. We made a trip down to the Smithsonian to study these two diamonds together. Um, and this was, I have to say, one of those really special moments with the Hope in one hand and the Wittelsbach graph in the other. Um, quite an opportunity, I must say. But the message that came from it was they are not from the same rough. Amazing to have such similar diamonds, perhaps from similar regions uh, in, in India at the time. But the amazing uh, testing that can be done today to actually study diamond growth structure allowed the team to say that they are not the same. Another historic diamond that surfaced recently and came to auction was the Farnese diamond. Uh, resided in the same family for over 300 years, a fancy deep violetish blue. To me, this is kind of classic Indian material. I, these dark, dark, rich blues, uh, such as the Wittelsbach, the Hope, the Farnese, just amazing. And to you see how these stones are valued, staying in the same family, this was, uh, you know, this was part of the dowry for Elizabeth Farnese with uh, Philip V. Other diamonds have also stayed in family for a very long time. You know, for example, uh, the Bulgari blue on the left and the Shirley Temple black diamond, a nine, almost 10 carat deep gray blue diamond. Uh, again, amazing, amazing stones in families for more than 50 years. And actually the Bulgari blue, uh, was sold at auction in 2010, and it set at that time a per carat record of $1.4 million per carat. So if we stay on that for a moment and think about auction sales, 
Um, I would also uh, go back a little bit in time. That uh, 437 oval, deep blue oval, was graded in 95. This was right after GIA introduced its nomenclature that, uh, and it brought fancy deep into the uh, nomenclature. Uh, it set a per carat price record of 569,000. But interestingly, you see that six carat, which some may remember, a vivid blue sold in Hong Kong, shattered that record uh, not too many years later in 2007 at 1.32 million per carat. This trend is continued. Um, this, the rarity of these diamonds, the value, uh, as you can see from this gemological data we've talked about, uh, have, have caused, them, caused them to go for exceptional prices, uh, even as recent as 2015, 2016. Uh, these are a few of the highlights in the, uh, from the auctions. Of course, the Oppenheimer Blue at 57.5 million. Um, you know, the Millennium Jewel 4, which was one of the stones from the Millennium Collection, uh, the Midnight Collection, uh, going for 32 million in 2006. And of course, the Blue Moon of Josephine uh, was just an amazing stone too. But these things really haven't stopped this, this amazing trajectory of blue diamonds and their ability to just still be in the, in the public eye uh, continues. And in 2018, it was with the discovery of a 41 carat uh, blue diamond in Botswana, a very unusual occurrence. Uh, it resulted in this 20 carat fancy deep blue diamond uh, that's currently on display at the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York. And the Lapatala collection, Lapatala meaning blue rock in the local dialect uh, near the Kulinan mine where these diamonds were discovered. Again, Kulinan mine diamonds. All five together in this short period of time were offered as a collection for sale in late 2020 and sold for more than $40 million. These diamonds I know are currently being finalized in the cutting and the manufacturing, there's documentation. I would, uh, I would say uh, expect to hear more very soon about these stones. Coming shortly after that, but actually being released before, uh, was this 39.34 blue rough from the Kulinan mine. Uh, it was noted at the time to have exceptional color and clarity, sold for $40 million also, the single stone for 40 million, not like the Let Lapatala collection of five. Uh, this diamond, there was a decision to manufacture this diamond first and have it lead the way. And the rough has yielded this 15 carat internally flawless vivid blue diamond that's going to go auction at the end of this month. So very exciting, largest of its quality to appear, to appear at auction. And just, uh, I think you'll, you'll have to stay tuned uh, and see, but I believe Sotheby's put the uh, estimate at 48 million to start. We'll see what happens with this stone, but exceptional color and amazing. Many things going on with colored diamonds continue to grow awareness. Same thing is true uh, for blues. These ex exhibitions, as I say, the Okavanga blue right now uh, is on exhibit. There's a lot more focus on cutting the roles at auctions, online president presences. But now I'd like to take a moment to come back very quickly here to some of the concepts that I started with with that Frank O'Hara Poet, poem excerpt. These qualities about blue and, and how I can relate to them and how they make us feel and my experiencing them really as art and how they link to emotional responses and to indeed how they carry that across in ways way beyond just uh, their, their data. Uh, I start with a quote from a, a good friend of mine passed away in 2018, the poet William Corbett. And I used uh, an excerpt from his poem in a monograph we did for the Pink Star. He was talking about a Willem de Kooning pastel. And he said, you must lean close, a beauty. I turn away pleasure that intense 
intensified by an eruption. And I think we've all experienced that. We see something that blows us away so much that we have to turn our head and before and look back. That's the kind of excitement I think comes with fine art and it comes with also these diamonds. And, you know, art blue in art and blue in diamond has such an allure. We see it throughout history. I could have picked dozens of other works, but I just wanted to highlight some examples here. And also the fact that from the early earliest times, there really was a combining of gems and fine art when lapis lazuli was what was ground into powder to make ultramarine, the most expensive blue pigment known at the time. And that's what you see used in some of the early Renaissance and Baroque paintings. So a real marriage uh, uh, and uh, speaking to the rarity that occurred. But this idea again of fine art in museums, I come back, it's not new to exhibit gems in museums. I, I understand that. And to exhibit gems in art museums, I should say, if I correct it. But I think what I'm getting at is not to have gems in a gallery in an art museum, but to have gems like occurred with the Starry Night Sapphire here, gems in dialogue with artworks in an art museum. Because I think that's where there is all new understandings and connections when you change context. And that's what starts happening in a setting like this. There was the exhibit between sea and sky, which was Persian blue and white ceramics and the Starry Night Sapphire weighing over a hundred carats. I like this idea of context and I use it in my own art. And I think sometimes when you can jar someone out of the norm and into a whole different situation, it causes you to experience and see things differently. So I have concepts that I've been working on to create a sculpture fabricated from a diamond rough crystal. And this example that, I, that I've done here digitally would be two meters high. So I think you begin to see these things in new light, experience them in new ways that gives a more profound meaning to them. Similarly, I created a piece called Yield, which looks at the concepts applied in our industry, right or wrong, of valuing different colors differently. Uh, so this piece was taking, I took three diamonds, all one carat rough, same weight, to be manufactured to the same quality, but differing in color. And I created the sculpture based on the size differences relative to their value as the finished stone. So clearly pink being astronomically different in size from the colorless or the brown. So I, I think there's things like this that cause us to pause, think, and handle ourselves differently around these objects. In my painting practice, um, I paint with encaustic, which is a liquefied beeswax with powdered pigment, damar resin. I, I love the way I can have color move from being very opaque to very transparent. Uh, I think this kind of elusive form, this kind of transparency are things that uh, I experience in looking at diamond. And I know there's an interrelationship that I move back and forth with, with how I view these stones and how I view my paintings. Sometimes even the color itself uh, is, is sensitive to what I've seen in gems. Transitions can be extremely subtle, uh, like it is with diamond color. Uh, sometimes I enjoy using the very deep colors like the Farnese blue. Uh, I also am very aware of mark making and the, the wrist movement that I use in painting. And in many ways, it simulates the wrist movement a diamond grader would historically use brushing off dust off a stone when viewing it in a microscope. And it's always intrigued me how as a diamond grader, you brush to remove and as a painter, I brush to add. But these kind of movements, the slow, steady observation, the kind, you know, the kind of attention to perception has been informed in my work as a gemologist and in my work as a painter. Similarly here, I think the ideas of how you can create light in a painting and how this internal light comes through in a diamond 
is critical uh, to the work I do. The layering, the, the difference in appearance from up close versus far away, the movement that you see. And I think you should move around a painting the way you should be able to move a diamond in your hand. You, you need to see the scintillation. You need to see the way light returns in a painting. And I think all of those aspects and qualities like move, like time come into play here that you're able to relate to in new ways uh, and see them as how they connect to us in deeper ways. Uh, in 2014, I, I created a, a very short three minute, 14 second video that I called Born Twice Yellow. Uh, again, this idea from a painter's point of view, a frontal view, I used images like we see here to show this transition from rough, rough to polished. And I know many painters have kind of documented their work, documenting a painting from the early stages to the finished stages. And I wanted to do that with what happens with the diamond and how it transitions and the beautiful kind of forms that it takes along that whole way. But I really, I do think of these things as a kind of painting with light. And I think anytime you can take this, putting it into a new context, it really kind of helps you and your understanding of uh, all the kinds of things you know, that you're able to gain from this. So um, as I kind of start to wrap up here, you know, I just wanna uh, again, thank everyone also to talk about how you know, these diamonds have power for really deep complex analogies with fine art. Uh, they're giving us very unique experiences and an awareness of our world and emotions. And I think when you're able to marry some of the structured, more scientific observations with the observations and feelings that are generated from looking at them from a context of fine art, uh, we really kind of raise this to a, a level of poetry. Um, I think, you know, as I said, I, I've always felt these should be shown in art museums. And I think now you probably see much more clearly my reasoning. Uh, they're, they're amazing in how they can speak to us and inform us. And uh, I hope that, you know, this has given you a little bit of information about blue diamonds, perhaps a, a fresh way of connecting with them, understanding their uniqueness. Um, and, you know, that you will find that it's kind of like one of those paintings. It's like uh, finding the right blue light, whether it's going to be a certain time of day, uh, a diamond or a painting. So thank you very much for your time. Wonderful, wonderful, fantastic. Um, I th think uh, um, judging by the chats that, that I see, everybody is really, really raving and very happy. Wonderful way to spend my Friday morning. What a fantastic, great, wonderful, um, great to see, uh, to see all these uh, reactions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. And um, there are some questions. And I love the first question, which was uh, put out by uh, Amy May. And I immediately connect to that because she says, Mr. King, I am a quilter and make gemstone blocks based on famous gems. Now, our joint friend, MJ Kinman, creates um, the patterns. She's currently working on a group of quilts based on some Smithsonian gems. I think you would be interested in seeing her work. Um, that means that you're not the only one to be inspired by um, um, by, by gems and 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 translated into art. John, tell us a little bit about the what goes on in your head and how it broadens your horizon um, uh, when you do this. What does it require to take that technical stuff that you've done for forty years and writing articles and doing and 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 looking into microscopes and saying it's, it must be this and then. And then you transfer into that free canvas where you put not only your knowledge, but also your emotion into. How does that work? <laughs> uh, Sorry, difficult, bit of a philosophical question. <laughs> I, uh, I think first, I think it's really wonderful to hear that about the other works. I truly understand and know many artists who are fascinated with gemstones and bring, bring that into their work in many ways. Of course, 
I, uh, I want to very much uh, for this talk speak to it from my own experience and my own feelings because that's what I know. That's what I'm really able to draw on. And, you know, Yaakov, I wish it were a, a simple uh, linear progression, but I think what happens in the studio in your, is you bring things, if you're really open, if you're really able to kind of like allow yourself to be open in what you're doing, you allow your world to kind of come in naturally and not force it. So the things that start to creep in and the similarities that start to happen uh, are not done in some conscious way. I'm not trying to say, well, you know, I use a lot of wrist movement in diamond grading, so I should use a lot of wrist movement in painting. Uh, I'm not saying I, I want slow, methodical observation in my painting because that's what I do in gemology. But I find if I go into my studio and I'm me, these are the things that naturally transcend. I was actually, I was talking with somebody in the studio a couple of weeks ago and, and you know, you talk of influences and, um, and you know, many times people will, will say, oh, I'm influenced by this painter, that painter. I think many of that, many of the times that's for the sake of the audience, not for the person because they need some sense of context. Um, but I think for myself, one of the things I would say is when, when I'm in the studio, I'm there alone. There's nobody with me. I'm bringing my world, my experience. And that is experience from wonderful travels for gemology around the world for many years, uh, looking at these gems, being sensitive to all those things. And so I think what has finally been able to come through over the years is this natural kind of marriage of all these things so that I become what I hope going forward is one person one person who does these things, not a gemologist over here and an artist over there. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, great. Um, oh, here a question by a former De Beers executive, uh, not the first one, Andy Coxon. Which blue did John fall in love with forever, if for it one, in all your examinations and your, uh, and your contact with blues? Oh, that is, that is not fair. That's hard. <laughs> that is very hard. But <laughs> I would say in an odd twist, the, the diamond that suddenly made me passionate about what blue could look like in a diamond was an unnamed, unknown diamond that passed through my hands in the late 1980s when I was just sitting diamond grading and it was an 11 karat blue pear shape. And I remember at the time, just all of a sudden being struck and stopping myself cold and look, just looking at it. I think till somebody finally had to like shake me on the shoulder and say, could you get back to work? Um, it's moments like that that you know. And then from there, I think certainly uh, it's been real opportune, but I think there's it's probably been nothing like the heart of eternity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Two more questions or three last questions. Um, Courtney Stewart, thank you so much for this wonderful task, uh, talk. Really love the connection to your artwork. I think a lot of people shared it with us. What do you think is the best step to exploit the color in blue and other colored diamonds? Does the brilliant best enhance this or does it in the rough? I'm not sure I understand the question completely. But I think that she, it meant that what, what is the, the best way to cut a color diamond? Is there it, a formula? It is, it is a very tricky uh, procedure. I mean, I, uh, generally, if the color is a deep blue, the desire is to make sure to continue to cut in a way that will bring a little bit of brilliancy in life so it doesn't go really dead and blackish. If it is more moderately light, uh, then the uh, tendency may be to eliminate too much brilliancy to help kind of deepen the appearance. So it's, uh, it really is kind of what you're starting with. Um, and it's easy for some of the blue to get lost in certain cuts because if you, if you think, for example, of a traditional uh, brilliant cut diamond, the, the brilliant cutting style, 
Uh, it is by design uh, attempting to create a light and dark pattern. So you can imagine how easy it is for uh, this blue color to kind of get lost in the black, the black of the black and white, or to get masked in that mix. So it's a, it's a very challenging uh, decision-making process that would go on. And it does start a lot with what is, what is the inherent body color? What is the color of the rough? Is that color in the rough even? Is it zoned? Um, are there inclusions I have to work around because some inclusions can cast, you know, different kinds of light in the stone. So uh, a lot of those are, those are the kinds of decision-making points that would occur in that process. Uh, then a last question. And after that, I'm going to make a remark because um, a good friend came online and mentioned something. What came first, art or, di or, or demology, or was it something that developed together? Um, actually, the art. The art came first. The art, mm. the art was there as a child, I would say. I, I was always drawing. Um, I had my undergraduate degree in fine art painting, and I moved to New York to, uh, to do graduate work to get my master's in painting. And it was uh, within months of having arrived in New York and started my, my school that I uh, was looking for work and saw an ad in the New York Times that said, work with diamonds will train. And uh, it was at the <laughs> Institute of America. And I thought, well, this sounds maybe aesthetic. It sounds like I'd be working with some sculptural forms. Let me give this a try. And little would I know just what that would mean in, uh, in the long run. Well, and we were the lucky ones that that happened. So <laughs> you could share your experience with us. John, I wish you a long life and lots of uh, and more uh, creativity. Um, why do I say that? Because my friend, Paris um, Martin Naman, who is a demologist herself, came online and she said, we have been inspired by our beloved famous collector, Eddie Alsace, who was a personal friend of mine for many, many, many years and was a very emotional and driven collector of uh, fancy colored colored diamonds and would tell me stories about he would, how decades and decades ago he would get, and get uh, diamond tears to go into the back of their safe and pull out those colored diamonds that were not were worth <laughs> at that time. So everything evolves and everything uh, goes that way. And today we are now in this situation that we see indeed colored diamonds, especially blues, um, being at the top of their game um, from a attention, point of attention and also, of course, of, uh, uh, in the... Uh, John, we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much for, um, for doing this for us. Uh, the recording, ladies and gentlemen, will be online within a few days, I hope. Um, and we'll send out another uh, message about that. On your left side of the screen, you saw the, um, the three books that we have published, including Hands Across Time. You can still get that book with John's article in it. Uh, go either to facetsmankind.org or um, you can get it on Amazon. It is still available. It is a wonderful book. It never fails to dazzle me. I've got it on my coffee table and uh, only the hologram is worthwhile picking up now and to, uh, to see it. Um, thank you, John, um, uh, for this third webinar. Our fourth webinar is going to take place on April 23rd and is going to be given by Ruth Peltasson, who is going to be speaking about powerful women and important diamonds. And we'll start pushing that forward uh, into, uh, into publicity from in a few days from now. And it will be another uh, wonderful uh, webs from now. Um, John, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. Um, a lot of people will certainly go back to recording because this was so much well, um, it, was, it was well presented information worthwhile to take a look again and look at it again and see this again, different perspectives of uh, Blue Diamonds. And it was really riveting, a riveting rhapsody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night.